Open the pod bay doors, Tom. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. What would you do with a brain if you had one? Do? Why, if I had a brain, I could... Miles per hour. I could wire away. 46, 56 degrees. Um, yeah, so I am Regina Barbie Graff. Um, I, like um, Susie said, I teach physics and astronomy at Western Washington University. Um, I also have a, a shameless promotion. I have a podcast, because everybody has a podcast, right? So um, I have a podcast. Um, it talks about um, science. It's called Spark Science. You can go to sparkscienceNow.com. We, we've had, this is our third season, we've had wonderful um, scientists talking, like Dr. Melissa Rice, who's right here, who works on the Mars rover. Um, and other people. Um, she's one of my favorites, though. Um, but I, uh, I wanted to talk about today, Hidden Figures. That's what you're all here for. It's an awesome movie. And I wanted to kind of get us ready. These are my screen savers. Studio Ghibli, you'll see that when I talk too long. Um, I wanted to get us all ready to kind of um, get into the movie and think about the kind of issues that are being talked about in the movie. Um, a little about myself. I grew up around here. I grew up in Lynn, Washington. Um, it was okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, went to, uh, that always um, I went to school here at Western Washington University a long, a, at the turn of the century. Um, yeah, only older people laugh at that. <laughs> I'll be teaching 18 year olds and they're like, mm-hmm, true. Um, and yeah, and I, this is my 10th year being a, a teacher. Um, only one of those years I taught in high school, but the rest of them have been at college, so I'm really old. And um, and I really loved this movie, and I loved it even more um, after I went over the book, and I want to talk about a few things. The, the structure of the science on the screen is a little different from any of the other ones you might have gone to. Um, what I would like to do is spend my first half hour um, kind of like 20 minutes lecturing, 10 minutes if there's any questions, or maybe five minutes. We're going to watch the movie, and then, as you see here, I would like to have a post-viewing discussion. And only because there's a lot of things that happen in the movie that I think people will want to talk about right after. And there's a, about 10 minutes that I'd like to go over things that you may not have known um, is, is actually true about the story that I can't really talk about unless you've seen the movie. So, um, so there's going to be 30 minutes before, 30 minutes after. So just try to stick around if you want to have that discussion. If you don't want to have the discussion, you are free to go. Um, <clears throat> yeah. All right. So. Let's talk about this movie. Here are the actresses that play uh, Mary, Catherine, and Dorothy. Um, I don't know if um, many of you know Janelle Monet. She is one of my favorite musical artists. My eight-year-old knows all of her songs. Um, um, but here are the actual women down below here. Um, and what I did is I took some time. This took me a long time to make, it, to make a NASA timeline that's um, relevant to this movie. So first of all, it wasn't NASA when these women started their positions. Um, it was called NACA, which is the National um, Advisory Committee for Aeronautics. Because when they started um, their, um, their careers, they weren't, like the government wasn't talking about space yet. So just keep that in mind when I keep on talking about NACA, it eventually turns into NASA, and we'll talk about when that happens. And, uh, but during this movie, it, there is kind of references to both of those organizations. So if you just kind of start with things that are relevant to this movie, like 1903, right? Brothers <laughs> Flight, you know, starts. Yeah. Um, you can very quickly, you have World War One, and that's when NACA was founded as an emergency measure during that war from um, the government founded this, this organization. And then in 1917, very soon after, they started building the Langley uh, Memorial Research Center in Hampton, Hampton, Virginia. So this all happened very, very quickly. Um, and in 1922, they hired their first female professional um, named Pearl Young. She's quite famous. Please look her up. Um, she, was a, uh, she was a physicist, and, she, and she's been interviewed, and she talked about how there was only 32 employees, and she had actually met all of them, like, her first day, which is um, a nice story. That's good. But it's, it was very small to start. When you get into World War II, that's when they start hiring more and more females um, because of the lack of... Um, I don't know, population to hire from, and a lot of, of the males are gone, it's a war. 
And they start hiring females specifically as human computers. And and uh, my friend was was, was very um, wise to tell me to explain what a human computer is real quick. Because if you're young, you don't really know. You, know, you can kind of imagine like androids or something. But what I mean is that these women would actually calculate by hand a lot of these very difficult uh, calculations needed by the scientists and, um, and engineers. And human computers weren't just at NACA, they were at other places too, but they were mostly female, almost entirely female. Um, when you have 1943, um, you, they, NACA actually purposely starts to recruit black women specifically. And it's because they were actually, uh, had the foresight to think, we not only want to, um, we're, we have a hiring shortage because of the war, but not only uh, men, but we, we're gonna hire women, but we're also gonna cast our net wide. We're gonna cast it as wide as possible, and we're gonna look for um, as many people as we can. So they actively start promoting or recruiting. Um, they do uh, hire, they are doing that, and that's great, but it doesn't mean that there was equality. Just because they actively recruited black women to be human computers, doesn't mean they were treated the same. So there was $250,000 um, of federal money to have housing for the white female human computers. Uh, and this was on a traditionally black um, university and the black women were expected to find housing somewhere else. Mm -hmm. um, so keep in mind that these things still happened. Um, in 1949, um, Dorothy Vaughn became the first black supervisor of NACA. That's a little spoiler alert, sorry. Um, she started in 1943. She started when all this, um, when they were actively recruiting, and she also started with Miriam Mann, which was the first um, African American um, human computer. Uh, and I'm saying a lot of names. I'm going to focus on the three that are in the film, but keep in mind that in the book there are so many people. Um, the book really does focus on Dorothy first, um, Catherine, Mary, but there are a lot of other people that are kind of in it. Mary and Catherine started in the 50s as well, um, and it's still NACA at this point. Um, then something amazing happens, right? Um, Sputnik uh, is launched. It's a the first artificial satellite. Um, it's it's launched by the Soviet Union, and space race starts, right? And then that's when NASA is established in 1950. All right. So in the movie, um, we kind of. Uh, this, the plot kind of revolves around John Glenn's orbit towards the end, and that's in 1962. And Katherine Johnson, who was Goebel, we'll talk about that very quickly, and you'll hear about it in the movie, um, helped a great deal with that mission. Okay, and then so my timeline stops in 1969, because that's when we land on the moon. Katherine Johnson is still involved in, in, um, in NASA. She's very instrumental. But I also wanted to put in, the book actually talks in, how, how many people have, read the book. Okay. <laughs> okay. Good. So I can just say anything you all believe. Okay. So uh, uh, Christine Darden um, is, a, is a person that's mentioned um, a lot towards the end of the book. And it's because she was one of the last human computers to be hired. And she was also the first African American woman to be promoted to a very, very high rank in NASA. So um, and, and Catherine Johnson is very proud of her. If you've um, ever read Katherine Johnson um, interviews, she actually talks about uh, Christine Darden a fair amount. So it's just something to kind of have in the back of your head when you're looking up this stuff. Okay, so what's helpful to kind of get you in the mood and get like kind of answer your questions before you start this movie? Well, first of all, um, the film producer, and this is uh, Donna Giuliani. We'll keep on going. Um, <laughs> she actually got a hold of this 55-page book um, proposal. So keep in mind that this script was actually born from a 55-page book proposal. The book was not completed yet. Um, and once you do read the book, it is full. It's very dense. It's full of facts. Um, so before that even started, or it, maybe it was done, I don't know, but. Um, for the next year, um, that producer, a screenwriter, and the author of the book actually worked on the script all together. So um, this script was not done without the author of the book, you know, not being involved, which is good. Um, so just to give you a back some background, here are the main players. The book actually starts with Dorothy Vaughn. She is the, um, the supervisor, um, 
and of the West computing um, area. It's the segregated human computing um, section where the East computing is the white female um, computing pool. Um, Catherine Coleman Goble Johnson, so Coleman is her maiden name. She was married. Her husband actually died of a brain tumor in 1956. So she was like in the thick of it. She was doing a lot of work. She was working long hours and then her husband died. Um, but so th it's, it's very, they don't go into that at all in the movie, but I can just imagine how stressful that was because NASA has a very, very intense kind of job situation. Um, the book goes into a lot of her background, Katherine Johnson's background. She uh, majored in math and French, and they don't really talk about how charming and brilliant she is in the movie. In the book, it's really emphasized that she is not only good at math, she's really good at math. Like, she graduated from college at 18. Like, she, she was very gifted. She was one of the first um, African-American students to um, ask to be integrated into graduate school at West Virginia um, State in 1939. She couldn't finish because of, of family issues. Um, but it, it, it's good to look into. She, she actually taught, like, a president's brother Roman numerals. She had a job at a very, very well-to-do hotel. So she met a lot of people. And she kind of not only smashes that stereotype of scientists being a white male, but scientists being kind of awkward and can't talk to people. She also smashed that, and that's something that isn't really talked about. Um, Katherine Johnson is also very, uh, sorry, Mary Jackson is, is also a very important person in the book that isn't really emphasized in this film. Um, and we'll talk maybe more about that in discussion. Um, all three women started their careers as teachers in segregated public schools in black public schools. And that really was the only option they had until NACA started actively recruiting. And that's something that also isn't really talked about in the film. All right. Um, if, uh, you know what? I get bored hearing myself a little bit too. So if there are questions throughout, maybe we'll do that. Maybe that'll be better. Um, so if you have a question, don't be scared. I'm not going to yell at you. Um, you can ask. All right, so what I want to do is I want to talk about STEM now, because a lot of people see this movie and they're like, we solved it, we solved racism, it's over. You know, um, but it's not. And uh, so we're going to talk about some demographics here. Um, so here on the right side, this is from NSF, the National um, Science Foundation. On the right side is the US population, left side is occupations. Um, keep in mind, this is just jobs. So this is actually also talking about people that we recruit from other countries to come to our to our um, to our um, country. So it's not just like this isn't exactly a one-to-one -one thing, but this is what we have. Um, so here's what we have, and we still see this discrepancy between gender and also race. And this is one um, small like snippet from this uh, this study, and it said that at every level underrepresented women earn a higher portion of degrees than their, their male counterparts versus the other way around. And that's something that is a very, I think, surprising fact for some people that um, that is actually happening. Um, if, when we start talking about this movie, we're not just talking about gender issues, we're talking about racial issues as well. Um, and I wanted to point out that I am a person, I am a woman of color, but that does not mean I suddenly can speak for black women in STEM. And I, th I think that um, there, there is an issue that we have, and even though I'm Chinese Mexican woman physicist, does not mean I can suddenly speak for what these women had to go through. And this, we have to be very, very, very wary of one-to-one -one relationships between marginalized groups, which keeps on happening, I think, um, less and less nowadays, which is very good. Um, but there's still an issue, right? So like this is a, this is a headline from uh, Society of Women in Engineering. We still find bias. And here's a report that I find very illuminating. Um, and it, it talks about experiences of women of color um, in STEM and just women in general in STEM. And it breaks it up by racial groups. And you can kind of see that, like for instance, you have um, uh, suggest uh, women should work less after they're having kids. It seems to affect Asian women a lot more than it does black women in STEM. And then you have like uh, stereotypical feminine roles. It seems to affect different groups differently. And what I wanted to bring up here is this idea of gender, gendered race or racialized gender or racialized sexuality. 
um, which actually there's a lot of studies on. If you go to, I wrote this down because I don't like saying in a study, but um, if, if you actually go to UBC Wiki, so University of British Columbia, they have a wiki, and you type in racialized sexuality, they have a lot of resources talking about this. Um, so there has, there is kind of this um, examples of stereotypes, for instance, like Asian men see, uh, are seen as more feminine, black women are seen as more masculine. So keep in mind those stereotypes that exist in our, in our nation when you look at these stats, right? Who is seen as more feminine, who is seen as more masculine? It, it's not just, they're not mutually exclusive, gender and race. They do interact in our stereotypes. It's very sad, the whole gen uh, custodial staff thing. That's a big one that I have actually experienced. Okay, so women of color in STEM today. So this is a slide that I, I took off another presentation I found. But it's just interesting. You have one in 10 scientists um, and engineers are women of color. Roughly one in five are uh, women of color in our nation. Um, so if you want to kind of that number to relate. And then you have this really interesting table here of how gender breaks down with these subsets of science. And then on top of that, gender and race. Um, so I just wanted to point that out. And why am I pointing that out? Because there are all these words that we use now when we're talking about inclusion and equity and diversity and all that kind of stuff. And one of them is intersectionality. And that's kind of one of the words I use in the, uh, the title here. I might be talking too fast. So is there any questions so far? Yes. What does STEM mean? I must have Oh, sorry. Yes, STEM. Thank you. That is not in my notes. Um, it's science, technology, engineering, and math. So whenever I say STEM, I just mean all of them. Science, technology, engineering, math. Thank you. Very brave. OK, so we're going to talk about intersectionality very quickly before I talk about orbits. Um, so there was a study in 1979, and a lot of women, um, it was mostly Latina, um, African American, a women who got together and started talking about what it meant to be a woman in STEM and also a woman of color. And that, that was put out. There was another follow-up, I think 30 years later. But they talk about this, this double bind thing. Um, and, and again, I just want to talk about this idea of intersectionality. What does that mean, intersectionality? It just means that somebody can have multiple parts of their identity, right? Um, you, can have, you can be a, a person in a marginalized group, and you can be a person in a non-marginalized group. Like for instance, I'm a woman, but I also am heterosexual, which means I'm part of that not marginalized group. Heterosexuals aren't really marginalized. So like, there, there's this thing where you can also deal with things um, with oppression from both of those marginalized groups, if you are both. Here's a very famous book, um, All the Women Are White, All the Blacks Are Men. Um, it's, it's pretty well known in um, studies uh, in, well, uh, multicultural studies at universities. And it's this idea that kind of when people say women, there's this racialized kind of um, unspoken association. And one of them is the wage gap, right? So people say there's the wage gap. And women make 77 cents to the dollar. They say that over and over and over and over again. But that's in itself racialized, right? Because it's not all women. So I mean, so we need to kind of think about these things when we, when we say women, when we say people of color, when we say um, certain groups, there is, it's more complex than you think. Why are, why are people going between diversity and why are people not using diversity anymore? I don't know if anyone's noticed that. People aren't really using that word anymore. And I'm gonna talk about that. Um, so I like this quote a lot. The diversity is being invited to the party. Inclusion is being asked to dance, right? <laughs> and I mean, that, that's really, really true <laughs> with my own experiences. Um, so what I have here is I'm just going to kind of put them up. Here's, here's a, a very recent um, graph of uh, who is actually getting degrees in our, um, in our country, STEM degrees, so science, technology, engineering, and math. <coughs> Uh, kind of broken up by race. You have who is getting, wh women by gender, who's getting the degrees just in the last like 2000 to 2012. And then you have this, who is getting the degrees and what is the education of their parents, right? So who, who kind of has that benefit of having parents who are educated. And the kind of 
mind blower that I've seen in some of the, the work that I've done and workshops that I've done is that it's hard for people to kind of intuitively think that some of these people here in this and some of these people here are actually the same person. <coughs> And, and I think may, maybe some of you are like, well, that's obvious. Well, it isn't obvious to some people. Um, because we, as people, we as scientists, like to compartmentalize. So we like to think there are these people, and then there are those people. But some of them are the same. Yeah? I'm just curious about the different uses of terms. STEM is more inclusive, but they have the S and E up there quite often. Mm -hmm. you know, why aren't these studies done like on the STEM like yeah, um, because people start arguing about computer science and also medicine that goes into it. So it starts getting much more complicated when you add also math degrees, like people start arguing about that. So I think with NSF, I think, um, well, let's see here. Yeah, I think with STEM, they don't really talk about, do they talk about medicine in this one? No. Okay. I think they're all encompassing this. Oh, there's also psychology and social sciences. I think that may be the difference. But in, in the conversations I've had, there's also other things like medicine and all these other things. Medical anthropology, kinesiology, um, neuroscience, that are half in sight, would be included here, but maybe not in, others, in another study. Um, I don't have the answer for why other people than NSF do something else, right? But NSF is. Any other questions? National Science Foundation. I will definitely answer these questions. I like us scientists. We talk in all these like acronyms and stuff. It's bad. Please ask me. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So I'm going to go just with this last thing. I'm going to kind of get us to kind of inclusion and equity next because. Somebody said this to me at work, and it was like, academia wants people that look different, but act the same. <laughs> right? And that's what we mean by people moving away from the idea of diversity. We don't want to just check numbers and be like, cool, 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 we, we're good, we're good, we're doing okay. We actually want to embrace people that are different and actually learn from them because it's not just a one-way street. It's not like, we're going to tell them what's up, right? So how do you do that? It's very hard. Um, but at Western right now, there's an equity and inclusion forum, and they have this, this system on how to actually do this. And it's very uncomfortable. I can actually even feel it right now. <laughs> but this is facts, right? We need it to get into this movie. Um, but how do you do this? So there's a, there's a sequence of steps that kind of help somebody kind of get to a point where they can help be inclusive and equitable in their teaching at Western, in their job. And the first step, is cultural awareness of self, which is the hardest one. I run these workshops, and this is the most uncomfortable workshop. People are like, I don't want to talk about myself. I don't want to put myself in a category. But the reality is we are, and we're treated um, by what category people think we're in. Right? So it's, it's very important to kind of be aware of those things. The next one is, and once you've actually experienced that, you kind of go to the next one, and you talk about the experiences with others. And I picked this picture specifically because there's a few of these things on here that I've like heard on campus, right? Like the touching the hair, you don't act that way. You know, I mean, this is just regular stuff that happens every day here in Bellingham. And um, until it's pointed out at these workshops, a lot of these people don't think about them. Um, the next one is to actually have conversations. So all the other stuff is kind of academic. It's not, um, actually having a deep conversation because it's a lot of I statements and nobody's arguing or anything. And it's a lot of sad stories, so people are just sad about that stuff. But how do you actually engage, right? How do you talk about these things? We, we, you you kind of practice these, these conversations. That's the next part. And then the last part is a call to action, which we have in the workshops where we're like, what, would you gonna, what are you going to do about it? What are you going to say when you see someone doing something? Or what are you going to say in your apartment to make it more equitable and equal to everyone? and not favorable to certain people. Um, OK. So I think I went over everything that I wanted to about that stuff. Now to the science. All right. So um, how are we on time? How, about, how long have I been talking? 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20? 30. 30? Oh, no. 30. I'll be, I'll be quicker, though. 
All right, so um, there's a specific scene, and I don't want to spoil this for you, but there's a specific scene um, in the movie, and there's a lot of math that's going on, a lot of physics. Um, I can't right now, you know, go through the intense, you know, differential equations that they go over, but I did see this one equation that I can do. So she went into this um, editorial meeting. Um, she writes down. She's calculating where this um, the 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 um, capsule is going to land, and she writes up this R, which means range, is equal to v squared. That's what that is right there. V squared times sine s i n um, two. That should be an angle in there over g, which is um, acceleration due to gravity. And I'm like, boom! I know what that is. All right. <laughs> it is projectile motion. All right. So I'm going to talk about projectile motion, I swear to God, only for like five minutes. Um, projectile motion is free fall plus constant horizontal motion. So what do I mean by that? I mean free fall is if you want to find like the distance some object falls, you have to know some initial velocity, you have, need to know how long it falls, you need to know the acceleration due to gravity, which is 9.8. And horizontal motion just means you have, you can find some distance and if it's constant motion, this A right here, this acceleration is zero, and you have some initial velocity, you can find out how far it moves this way, and how far it moves that way. Projectile motion it moves in both directions. All right, so if you have something moving in both directions, it has some initial velocity, it has some X part of it component, it has some Y part of it component, and that's where these sines and cosines come in. Um, for most of you, you're like, I got this. And other, some people are like, I don't want to think about trig ever. <laughs> um, we're going to, real quick, just so I can prove to you that that equation that you put up on the board, that's for real, that's projectile motion. Um, so what you can do is you can kind of break up this equation right here. You can talk about that change in distance. So change in distance is some in, um, y position and some initial y position. That zero should not be there, that annoys me. Um, and what they do is they solve for time, right? So they solve for time. And then they put that time into this equation over here, and then boom, some trig substitutions. And, uh, ugh, oh my god, there we go. Some trig substitutions, and they get that equation that you saw on that first sheet. So that's all, she, that's all she's doing. She's just doing projectile motion. And she's doing that um, equation very quickly, and that's the important part. She's doing it in her head, and that's the impressive part. <laughs> all right. So when they're talking about orbits, I always like to talk about this in my Physics 161 class. We have Newton and back um, in 17, whatever he was in, 80 something, am I right? I'm like calling him in. Pretty sure he lived around there. Um, he thought, okay, how do you put something in orbit? And he had this thought experiment where he said, okay, if I put a cannon on the top of a mountain and I shoot it, it's just gonna fall, this projectile motion, it's gonna hit the ground. But if I shoot it even, like, with more gunpowder, it's going to go even further. It's going to go even further. And if I do that so it goes all the way around, all the way around, it's just going to keep on going and keep on going. And you're thinking to yourself, why is that? Let's go back to this. Right? There's constant motion in x right here. If this is 0, then there's nothing to slow it down in this direction. So if the curvature of the Earth is changing at the same rate as it as the ball is falling, it's just gonna keep on going around. Right? So here are some other flight paths that they talk about in the movie, hyperbolic flight paths, parabolic flight paths, elliptical. Um, you can look at that. Um, Newton had these three laws as well, which some people love, some people hate. Um, inertia, what that means is that if you have something and you give it some velocity, it's just going to keep on going forever and ever unless there's some force to, to slow that down, which is what's happening with this orbit. There's no force to slow that down. F equals ma, force equals mass times acceleration. We had a lot of that going on right here. I don't really have to go into that right now. But last but not least, you have this action and reaction. So if you have some, um, if you have some force, you're going to have some interacting force. And so. I'm not going to go into these simulations. I really want to. But, um, <laughs> uh, is it like seven now? It's five after. after. Let's just do this one. <laughs> All right? So just do the one. Um, this is, oh, it's not going to. Just do it. 
Yeah. All right. So if you want to learn more about projectile motion, which is very fun, you should go to FET, so P-H-E-T, and just put in FET simulations in Google, and it'll take you here, and you can shoot things off. You can change the thing that you're shooting off like a human person. <laughs> you can do a Buick. You can change the angle, because what if I want to hit that target, or what if I want to hit the statue? Spoiler alert, his pants fall off if you hit him. Super inappropriate. Um, so, and you can, you can put in, um, you can put in friction, so you do have um, some resistance and it does slow down in X. Awesome stuff. Um, let's go back to this. These other simulations taught, and they're from Kansas, um, or sorry, not Nebraska, not Kansas. Uh, Nebraska University, or what is it? University of Nebraska, Lincoln, I believe. Um, and they talk about this idea, people say, how can you have, how can the force acting on Earth from the sun be the same as the force acting on the sun from Earth, right? This is the whole Newton's third law action-reaction pairs. And people are like, this is crazy. The sun is so much bigger, how can it feel the same force? And if you play around with this kind of simulation here, oh, this is another FET simulation, you can kind of see that the sun does feel a little bit of force, it does wobble a little bit, um, and that's actually how we find, one way how we found exoplanets, because you have this wobble in a star, then you notice that it has something pulling on it. Um, so, very fun stuff. What we're gonna do is we're gonna stop there, we're gonna watch the movie, then we're going to talk about some crazy stuff afterwards. <laughs> All right. Unless there's quick question. Any quick question? People just want to watch the movie. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. check him, that's all true. He was awesome. He actually, I think it was more because he didn't actually trust computers, is what it was, that uh, apparently um, a lot of pilots and people in the military didn't really trust uh, the computers doing all the calculations. They trusted people that they could actually look, them, look people in the eye. That's an, a direct quote. Um, and so that that's awesome. There are things that aren't quite accurate, which I'm going to talk about right now. Um, and again, we can ask questions and stuff like that. And I'll try not to be super long because it's nine something and I'm old and I lose. So. Could you use um, the microphone, please? Oh, yeah, sorry. I thought I was just crazy loud. <laughs> um, is there any way we can project it out? Should we? Should we? I mean. Close the curtain. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. There we go. <coughs> All right. So, I mean. Post viewing discussion, I'll let you kind of all talk to each other and ask me questions too towards the end here. Um, good, bad, it's a drama. They had to dramatize, uh, may not have happened. You know, that's, um. So what I want to talk about is like, like I said, John Glenn part, super real. Other things had to be kind of condensed. Um, maybe some of you noticed from my timeline and also the timeline that's in the movie um, that um, the, there was um, supervising roles. Um, Dorothy Vaughn was actually an earlier supervisor for the um, West Computing Area, so that's kind of different. Maybe some of you have read the controversy where um, it wasn't actually Katherine Johnson that had to go, um, that had to travel that distance to the bathroom. We'll talk about that in a little bit. So timelines have been overlapped. Um, segregation was actually over in 1958 at NASA um, at federal. Uh, buildings, federal, uh, federal um, installations, there was no segregation, but there was in Virginia, so there wasn't quite a problem outside of that. So people have given this movie a little criticism because there were some timelines that have been smushed, but in personally, um, everything that happened in the book kind of happened in this movie, but in a shorter amount of time, slightly different, and plus or minus three years, in my opinion, isn't that big a deal. Um, the composites, um, Jim Parsons' character and Kristen, uh, Kirsten? Is it Kirsten? Is it Kirsten? Yeah. Downs, um, they're, they're not actual people. I think it would probably be hard on the families to be like, you know, 
my great grandma was that person or my grandma was that person. So the composites of people, but it, it's not un, um, inaccurate in the sense that there were problems um, with people at NASA, but they're also good allies at NASA as well, but they had to have somebody representing that, um, I would say, that view that was at NASA. Uh, Kevin Costner's character, like chewing gum all the time, um, <laughs> they had to give him a thing. Um, he's actually a composite of three different directors that, um, at Langley, so he actually was not a person named Al Harrison. That did not happen. Um, I'm gonna get. I'm gonna take four minutes of your life watching more TV. Sorry, <laughs> um, because we're gonna watch this Vice News. It's four minutes. It's quite illuminating. And then after that, we can kind of talk. So I'm gonna do that. Let's see if this Houston, we have a problem. Movies about the American space program almost always feature white men. I had no idea there. Quite a few women working in the space program. But one new film breaks with that trend. She can handle any numbers you put in. Hidden Figures tells the true story of the black women mathematicians who work behind the scenes to help launch Americans into orbit for the first time at the height of the civil rights movement in the South. What do you ladies do for NASA? Calculate your trajectories. The film centers around the life of Katherine Johnson, who's played by Taraji P. Henson. Dexter Thomas visited the real Katherine Johnson at her home in Virginia. What do you think needs to be shown of your life? We're gonna show you where I lived and uh, what trouble I got into. What kind of trouble did you get into? Can't tell it. Kevin Johnson just turned 98. Can't tell it. She quit her career as a computer at the Langley Research Center in Virginia in 1953, calculating and plotting test data. Her calculations helped launch the first American into orbit and were used for America's first moon landing. Graduating summa cum laude from college at the age of 18, becoming a career mathematician seemed to be the most natural fit. There's a lot of other things you could have done. What was it about math that made you think, I want to do this with my life? To show it could be done. And then it was so easy to do. I've got to say, math did not come easy for me, I think, for a lot of people. Why not? Did your mother like math? My mom did like math, yeah. Well, usually when they said their mother didn't <coughs> like math. <laughs> but I found it very useful. Black women who worked at NASA had to deal with both sexism and racism in the segregated South. The movie does a great job of showing their struggles, but it's not a documentary. It's a Hollywood dramatization. I keep up in that room. One scene shows Katherine Johnson having to walk a half mile every day just to use a colored bathroom until her white boss steps in to save the day. We don't get to the peak together. We don't get there at all. Johnson says that never happened. Did you have to use a colored woman's bathroom? I yeah. just went on in the white one. <laughs> you just went in the white woman's restroom. You just used whatever bathroom you wanted to use. I asked the film's director, Ted Melfi, why he wanted to include a scene that never happened. He said he's focused on the overall message of the movie. You know, when you're making a film, you want to you dramatize the plight. And the plight was everyone of color had to use that colored bathroom. So she, re she, being a woman of color, represented everyone that had to use those bathrooms. Yeah. I guess I, I wonder about, basically, the white dude is the one who comes to him and says, segregation is over. Mm -hmm. Whereas, in reality, at least for this one woman, she's the one who decided, I'm going to the white bathroom, forget y'all. Does it diminish at all what Katherine Johnson did in real life by refusing to go to the bathroom? I, not for me. People might say, oh, you have, it's a, it's a white savior. The white savior. White savior complex. Savior complex. Yeah. I mean, that's part of, that's part of the, the bigger issue as well. I mean, yes, there needs to be white people that do the right thing and black people do the right thing and someone does the right thing. And so who cares? Who does the right thing as long as the right thing is achieved? So that's how I took it. Just like a real life bravery, Katherine Johnson's greatest achievements were behind the scenes. But she said she would have been more than happy to switch roles if she had the chance. Did you ever want to be the person going up to space? Yeah, if they had offered me a ride, I would have gone. <laughs> See what was out there. Okay, so. 
lot of feelings after you hear that director talk about that stuff. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I, I just wanted to point out, it was a blockbuster. It's uh, not really the norm to have a, a blockbuster uh, featuring uh, three or any African-American women. So, wanted to point that out there. Um, so I'm gonna just like bring it back if anyone wants to kind of talk about or ask questions um, about what you just saw. <laughs> yeah. So when did this all come to light and why did we not know about it back then? So yeah, so the book talks about that a lot, is that um, in the NASA community, Katherine Johnson and the uh, African-American human computers, all that was well known. It just wasn't really publicized. Actually, um, Katherine Johnson, when she did those calculations, she did that for John Glenn. That actually happened. That all happened. Um, it, it was over a day. It wasn't like a couple hours like the movie, but it was like a day. Um, that, it was actually in the news locally in Virginia. It just nobody picked it up. And uh, yeah, it, um, the, the writer of the book grew up in that area. And so she actually started visiting people um, like coming back from college and hearing these stories, and then like later on when she graduated and became a writer, she started hearing more and more and then decided to write a book. But people knew it just wasn't something In people Virginia. thought they would want to know. Want to know. Yeah. yeah. Any qu other questions? I was just raising arms to stretch it. Yeah. How much uh, did the calculations have to do with the GPS type of calculations, which basically developed in the same time, right? Sort of position, uh, that was a, the new math when they want to calculate where spaceships actually are in, in Yeah, like location? Yeah. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I do not know the answer to that. Any, somebody else might know. No. <laughs> I do not have the answer to that, but I will look it up later. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. space, uh, GPS is based on timing, um, yeah. signals, and that was much more Really, it's yeah. based on basic inputs and outputs of velocity and projection. Do you mean like this launch was a lot more primitive th than the timings that you're talking about, or the other way around? The this launch used much more primitive. I mean, GPS is highly accurate timing right. signals to measure basically gravity and distance from a, a light signal to probably go into position. So it's I would say it's relatively unlimited. Okay, and Everybody developed differently. Probably separately, yeah. and they share some. Yeah. yeah. I get a vague idea from the movie what the go no go is, but what specifically is the go no go? It seemed like that was crucial f to so many things. Yeah, I mean they they have to make sure that the that the uh, so to, uh, to repeat the question, um, like what is specifically is the go no go? It you have to decelerate at a certain point. If you want to hit the Bahamas at the exact point, then you need to make sure that you decelerate at a certain point so that what you saw, that projectile motion equation, so that that's accurate. What she did was that kind of backwards calculate. So if they don't decelerate at the exact point, then you're not going to hit the Bahamas. So that, What's that's what the go, no go option, though? If it's not correct, do you not go or? Right, yeah, and then you do another loop. And then you oh, I see, I see. Yeah. Okay, that's what I wasn't understanding. Yeah, sorry. I see. Yeah. Just off of that, um, is that what is currently the re-entry window? Is that the same thing? They just hadn't come up with that terminology yet? The, 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 no, the point no-go? I, Casey? <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know, if, I mean, they sound interchangeable, but I do not work at NASA, but yeah. I mean, because you're going so fast that you have to do it then, because if you don't do it then, you're going so fast that you're gonna miss that point, you're gonna miss the bonus. Just go around one more time, try again. But because he missed that, he, well, because the heat shields were messing up, you yeah. kind of couldn't do that. And it's a, I, I do want to say a really quick thing too. My daughter, I took my daughter to go see this movie, she's eight, and it was about January, and she was freaking out when that scene happened with the fireball and everything. She's like, is he gonna live? And I was like, he died a week ago at like 93. <laughs> <laughs> he had a long, happy life. And she's like, oh. <laughs> so like Right? He was like 93, yeah, something yeah. like that. 96? Okay. <clears throat> but he's fine. He's fine. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. I have a comment. Yeah. I thought uh, this movie made really interesting the consequences of smart 
policy and the right people to help pull up uh, and using basically the, the public institutions to broadly pull up and, uh, resources and capabilities that would not naturally be drawn by society. Right. And the, the space program is a really wonderful example of this, of being able to say they, they needed the capability so quickly they didn't have time <coughs> to fall back into the racist pre-existing uh, structures that right. were engendered structures at the time to a degree. To a degree. <laughs> but, but that's yeah. still the context of it. This is how progress begins, right? And that you have broad capabilities. So I, I think it's very fascinating to see the broader social consequences of big social programs like this that really require the resources of a nation right. and, and smart decisions being made in the context of that. Yeah, they were really pragmatic. They were like, you know, we need to get this done, so where are these resources? And we've already tried there, and there's nothing there, so we're going to go over here. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So okay. what was the disparity in oh, the way just, oh, was it somebody else? Oh, no, that's okay. Oh, what was the disparity in the wages paid to the women that were actually coming up with these calculations as opposed to the suit guys? Yeah, so I don't have I don't have the numbers. The book does. Like, the book is full of facts. So like, you go in there and it, like, tells you the wages of uh, the women, the human computers, and then actually the black women and female computers were paid less. Um, noticeably so. And it wasn't just, like, a little bit. It was, like, giant percentages so uh, and the women were paid less so it was just kind of like this ladder that existed in society that still does. <laughs> and so you had a question right up there. it was more of a comment about kind of the context of time that um, i grew up at johnson space center oh, my cool. dad was down there at nasa and I remember, you know, my dad not coming home for like 36 hours. Yeah. We would take food to him. Yeah. But, um... And that was actually talked about in the book, uh, the long hours at NASA. Oh, yeah. And it, yeah. like, it affected all of these people from the very beginning, from the 40s. Yeah, and, and, but what was interesting is they would shut it down. If they didn't have it, they would stop, no, no matter what the Russians were doing. But if okay. they weren't sure, they would stop. Yes. And close the window and delay the whole mission and everything else. And I, I really respect that respect of science. Yeah. And I'll go a little bit political and say I missed that. <laughs> yes, I was at the march too. <laughs> um, um, I do want to say that the book does touch on that a lot, and it touch, um, so it touches on this idea of. NASA having to be certain before, and a certain level of certainty before they went up and, and launched these missions, it was like 99.9% .9 like success was at, at that time. So like it was a one in a thousand chance that you this was not going to go. And so it talks about that. Um, I don't know if the percentages are the same with with missions. <laughs> We're like not. Oh, okay, they're even higher. Um, but it yeah, it, it talks about how awesome that was and then they, they would stop they would be like we're not going to go unless we have 99.9% success Question. did Octavia's character really fix the IBM machines so I don't <laughs> know about that part okay. but I do know that she was one of the first Fortran programmers that was all accurate uh -huh. um, so and she did she did have the forethought to be like I human computers are going to become obsolete I'm going to train the people that I've been working with all this time that was yeah, all true was she did train her fellow um uh, African American human computers in the West area to be actually be able to work on the computer. That all goes true. Yeah. Do we know if the Soviets were using female engineers and what the male female ratio was in their labs? So I so the book did touch on this too, and it talked about this idea um, that in the Soviet Union there wasn't really that much of a gender um, gap as there was in the U.S. Like there wasn't. It didn't say it didn't talk about uh, female human computers, but it talked about how in the Soviet Union there was a large amount of. Of female engineers and mathematicians that were being um, utilized. So we yeah, did talk about that. I think it's striking that scene where Kevin Costner is speaking to his scientists yeah. and engineers and saying, why are we in second place? What are they doing? Yeah. I can't believe that they're smarter or they have better technology. Yeah. And the obvious thing is, well, they're drawing from their full talent pool. Cool. Yeah, it was, I, I think the, I, I'm trying to remember the numbers, I didn't write it down, but I think it was like a third of the 
um, graduates for, with science degrees were women in the Soviet Union. Um, so, yeah, something something like that. And I remember the scene in the movie where he's it's like, go and call your wives. And all you men have done a great job. And I'm like, there's two ladies there. Um, and in real life, uh, Catherine Johnson was not the only um, black woman who was working in, in the area. There was actually another um, computer, but she was the only one that was actually doing a lot of the not just the plugging in the numbers, but the, the theory behind it and the math. So that's why she later she got hired as a mathematician. And that's what that last thing was. <laughs> well, exactly. Any other questions? Did we just want to go home and go sleep? <laughs> yeah? All right. Well, I had a good time. Thank you for listening to me.